Morning, everybody. Brian Newber here again from GoldenBlack.com here in the old home office. It is Wednesday, May 13th. This is your GoldenBlack.com daily quarantine simulcast for today. Our uh, little daily uh, quarantine pastime here where we just talk about a Purdue uh, topic, put it on a variety of platforms, hopefully help you pass the time. If you have time that needs to be passed, help keep you engaged, whatever it may be. Uh, it is brought to you by Fox Purdue Bookstores. Purdue Federal Credit Union, uh, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank, East End Grill, and the Charters Team Remax Ability Plus. Want to remind you once again, if you're looking for a hell of a dinner uh, during quarantine, um, Sixth Street Dive in Lafayette, East End Grill in Lafayette, Arnie's in Lafayette, West Lafayette, and all over the state, Bruno's in West Lafayette, and the Whitaker Inn in West Lafayette all remain open for Kara orders. Please keep them in mind if you're looking for a hell of a dinner or to simply support our local businesses uh, during this interesting time in our history. Um, also, if you're accessing this via YouTube or if you're accessing this on our Golden Black Radio podcast platform, please be, be sure to subscribe uh, to our various products because the world will soon start spinning again and we will have more and more stuff uh, on those platforms and you'd want to get access to them, presumably. Uh, as soon as possible. If you're watching this every day, chances are you would be interested in uh, whatever's to come when things normalize a little bit. You know, throughout this process, it's been a little bit of a challenge to come up with topics every day. Uh, today, obviously, is not one of those days uh, because for the second time in like a month or whatever it is, um, you know, Purdue's basketball team was hit with a high profile transfer. So uh, yesterday's No Gel Eastern news gives me plenty to talk about here. We have total coverage on our website, goldenblack.com as is, uh, but figured I would also discuss it here. Um, obviously, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a disappointment in the sense that, you know, Purdue's now without both of its seniors, uh, its anticipated seniors uh, from this past season, Purdue will now go back to back years without a single fourth year senior on scholarship. That's kind of a sign of the times nowadays in college basketball to a certain extent, uh, but also a little bit disappointing uh, for Purdue because, and anybody in such a situation, because one thing college coaches always want to do is be old, be experienced, and stay that way. It is getting increasingly difficult to do that. Transferring is normalized nowadays. There's no stigma about it, nor should there be. Uh, you know, obviously players have every right to control their careers. Uh, to the furthest extent to which they can. And if this transfer waiver um, brings Armageddon to college sports, suddenly, all of a sudden, you know, not only are you vulnerable to transferring, but it is the name of the game. Uh, and hopefully, for everyone's sake, that rule does not pass. As is, you know, obviously, players have freedom to do what they want with their careers, and that's certainly their right. Obviously, Matt Harms left as a graduate transfer, uh, ended up at BYU. No Joe Eastern departs as what I can only assume will be a sit one to play one uh, situation. He was not marked as a graduate transfer on his NCAA transfer portal entry um, that I got a hold of yesterday. So I would have to assume he will have to sit a year uh, to play a year wherever he goes. Uh, what Purdue is losing here in No Joe Eastern, obviously, um, an elite defender, one of the best defenders, if not the best defender, I think Matt Painter's had at Purdue. It's my opinion, he's the best perimeter defender. Um, Matt Painter's had at Purdue. If you're in Camp Kramer, I'm not going to argue with you uh, because that's 1A, 1B. Both are both were extraordinary defensive players for Purdue. I think Nogel Eastern's a little bit better. I think he's more versatile. He's more complete uh, and just as impactful. Um, that is what you lose in Nogel Eastern above all else. You lose an elite defender, a game-changing defensive player. Obviously, that has come uh, with certain limitations that have been well-documented at the offensive end of the floor. To me, the biggest thing for him in his Purdue career lately, I don't think I ever said this, but I should have. Don't worry about the jump shot. To hell with it. If you can't shoot, you can't shoot. Worry about what you do really, really well. That is your ticket. Uh, that is how you, you become a good, productive, winning player. Um at Purdue and now wherever else you go. Uh, don't be defined by what you can't do. Be defined by what you can do. And I think that was how people probably should have viewed No Gel Eastern maybe a little bit more than they did. I get it. Jump shooting is very, very visible 
uh, skill when you struggle with it. It's right there. It's laid bare out in front of everybody. But I also think that took on outsized influence on the way people viewed him. The free throw shooting obviously didn't help either. But what you know, Joe Easterm did do well tended to take a back seat to, at least in the court of public opinion, to what he maybe didn't do as well. Um, I think as a sophomore, he had a very good season. I think, you know, Purdue had a couple of offensive players in its backcourt and Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein that had significant gravitational pull uh, from a basketball perspective. And Purdue did a good job finding a place for Nojel Eastern's offensive skill set where they could kind of camp him out in the corner a lot, let him drive off of other people's off of other people's uh, actions, um, but also get him in position to, you know, be on the offensive glass to use his physical advantages against smaller guards on the glass, on the occasional post up, whatever it may be. I thought this year the goal was going to be to get him a good amount of organic ball screens in motion or sets, whatever it may be, allow him to get a smaller defender on his hip a little bit, get him some more post ups on that smaller guard and just feature him a little bit more offensively. Hope he finished around the basket a little bit more efficiently than he did the year before. It just never happened. You know, people look at Nojel Easterman and say, Hey, I don't know if he's a point guard. I don't think he's a point guard. Well, you know, Purdue didn't really ask him to do Chris Paul stuff. I mean, this isn't a high ball screen. This isn't a point guard driven offense. It never has been. Look at the assist numbers for Purdue's quote unquote point guards over the years. Motion offense central decentralizes decision making and passing responsibilities over everybody. It's not it's just not a point guard uh system. It's it's just not. Um so Keaton Grant wasn't necessarily a point guard. John Octius wasn't necessarily a point guard. What you needed from No Jelly Stern and all your players really was simply good decision making. And I think that was something Purdue across the board lacked last season. And I think what you saw, and this applied to Matt Harms as well, is the changing dynamics of Purdue's team from one year to the next really kind of laid bare some of their limitations uh, to a certain extent. And I think the burden of expectation, you know, probably was a thing for those guys. They were viewed as the guys who had to elevate their games, had to carry this team now as upperclassmen, do more than they did before. And I don't know if that was necessarily the right way to kind of view things. Purdue just never found, didn't have the sort of gravitational offensive players that could have made the other people around them better as pieces. That's what Matt Harms and Nojel Eastern were offensively as sophomores. They were pieces. They were good pieces. They were really good pieces. Pieces made that team work. Um, but when pieces were asked to be foundations or took it upon themselves to try to be foundations or put the sort of pressure on themselves to be foundations, it just, it just didn't happen. And what Purdue needed from those guys was simple consistency to play like experienced players, uh, to be leaders. And a lot of the things I just listed off in terms of what Purdue needed from those two juniors happened to be things Purdue sorely lacked uh, this season in terms of consistency, in terms of, the look of an experienced team and leadership. Purdue clearly was lacking in those three areas. And that has to start with your older guys. Obviously, it wasn't just the two juniors who would qualify as older guys. Uh, but those are the, guy, the guys who played in most games. They played in NCAA tournament games. They played in big games. They won a title. Uh, those were the guys it had to start with. It didn't happen. And now both of them have left coming off a bad season uh, for Purdue by its standards. Um, I don't know what this means for Purdue's lineups next season. I can tell you that Purdue has a lot of guards next season. Uh, I think their backcourt is going to be as deep as it's been um, since Dakota Mathias, Ryan Klein, and Kendall Stevens were all at the same position at one point in time. I don't know if this affects the guard core uh, because I don't know if I was even considering Nojel Eastern a guard for next year. Uh, I say that because I think Purdue would have used him in a variety of different roles as you saw him play this season. He played point guard, technically, for w whatever that even means in Purdue's offense. Um, he played all over the place. I think next year, my guess, my educated guess, uh, would have been Purdue would have used him a little more in the front court. Probably had that be its starting point, maybe put him at the quote-unquote four, basically role with four guards. Um however you want to call it. There's a lot of ways to call lineups nowadays when there's so much blurring of positions, but I think Purdue might have run a four guard type of lineup out there um, with 
the rare guard who can hold up physically against other forwards that could have given you a faster lineup that could have given you a uh, just a more dynamic sort of lineup it would have found a place on the floor too for no gel, no gel eastern's defense uh, now I, I don't necessarily know Purdue's forward position is basically up in the air aaron wheeler obviously comes back uh, presumably I, I have to say that now uh, after the spring has been so eventful i have to say presumably about everybody uh, Aaron Wheeler comes back, uh, Mason Gillis uh, comes out of red shirt. Those are two guys who factor into your forward position. Possibilities certainly exist. You can find somebody else in the graduate transfer wire. It is mid-May, and the transfer wire is pretty well picked over. You have two open scholarships now for next season. I still would be a little bit surprised if Purdue found somebody. I'd be even more surprised if they found somebody who's capable of making an impact. Uh, but Purdue will look, um, but it's that forward spot where I think maybe no Joe Eastern's departure matters more from a depth chart perspective uh, than the actual backcourt. Um, you know, Purdue, uh, I still think can be pretty good next season. Obviously you have lost your two seniors. You've lost your two most experienced guys. At the end of the day, you also lost two guys with no real guarantees uh, on anything for next year. Two guys who had people come in behind them who were serious threats to their roles. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I didn't mean to minimize Matt Harms' departure. I do think Purdue will miss Matt Harms perhaps seriously. And I don't mean to minimize the impact of his departure by referring to him as Purdue's backup center. But he was Purdue's backup center who wasn't playing uh, more than 20 minutes a game um, for the better part of the back half of the season. No gel Eastern, I think, was going to have to secure his place, whether it be in the backcourt, whether it be at forward, whatever it may be. I think Purdue would have been naturally inclined to find a place for him uh, because of his defense. But even if you put him at forward, you were going to have to configure your matchups defensively, uh, too, to make sure he's on the guy you want him on, um, which would have required a little bit of tinkering. Uh, but I do, he would have had a role, uh, but I don't think in either case, guys were, neither of these guys were guaranteed. Uh, 25 to 30 minutes a game. Uh, both of these guys, I should say this from a personal perspective, great human beings, great people. Uh, it is unfortunate uh, in every level that things ended this way uh, for Nogel Eastern at Purdue. I think he should have been a wildly popular player at Purdue. I think he's got the personality. He's got the charisma. He's a great human being. He's got good heart, uh, just a good kid, thinks about others before himself. Um, what he does as a player reflects things that Purdue has always taken pride in defense, physical toughness, selflessness under a very different set of circumstances. I think he would have been a, a very, very, very popular player. I don't think there's anything ever to be gained from fighting fans online. Um, because sometimes you have to just kind of be, kind of be above it. I think that that kind of was a lightning rod for criticism on, on no jail Eastern. I think the jump shot, you know, obviously was something that people viewed in an outsized manner relative to the rest of his game. And he took a lot of, a lot of hell from fans. It's unfortunate. That's kind of the, that's kind of the world we live in nowadays. Um, but it is unfortunate. It ends this way uh, for him at Purdue because he helped Purdue win a lot of games uh, his first two years at Purdue, he was he was a good person. He was a he was a good player at Purdue, and uh, I think under a lot of circumstances, he would have been a very popular guy who fans would have missed very much. I'm not saying fans won't miss him. I'm saying that he took a lot of a lot of hell from people that you know perhaps was not something he was deserving of. Not that I think any player should be should should be cyberbullied necessarily, but that's kind of that's probably a strong term I just used. But you know what I mean. Um, that's kind of the world we live in nowadays, uh, unfortunately. And um, it's unfortunate that, you know, he ended up taking the sort of peck from people, hell from people that he ended up taking because he was, he was a good player for Purdue. He was a good person at Purdue, and he's a good person, period. And uh, I'm sure in some way, shape, or form next season, Purdue will miss him. And uh, there might come a time or two next season during games when Purdue is struggling on defense where somebody might say, hey, it's too bad we don't have no Jell Eastern anymore, or it's too bad we don't have Matt Harms anymore. Um, you know, Purdue now doesn't have a 2017 recruiting class. Essentially, Aaron Wheeler 
uh, is the only guy left. Uh, Sasha Stefanovic. I'm sorry, I, I forgot about Stefanovic. I, I thought it was Eden Ewing, Aaron Wheeler, uh, Harms, and Eastern. I forgot about Stefanovic. So Purdue now has two guys in its class of 2017 out of the five it signed. And um, that's, again, sort of college basketball nowadays. So Purdue, again, uh, incurring a bit of a personnel loss here, uh, but also going back to a situation where now it's juniors have to be it's seniors. Now Eric Hunter, Sasha Stefanovic, Tregon Williams, those are your experienced guys, and um, it's their turn to lead, whether it be vocally, whether it be by example, whether it be whatever, um, in this bizarre offseason where the team's not even around each other until until who knows when. So I am talking in circles at this point, so I am going to cut that off here. That's what I've got on No Gel Eastern, the news of him uh, transferring out of Purdue after three seasons yesterday. Wish the best for him. He was always good to me. Uh, I very much appreciate that. I appreciate that from all these guys who who, who put up with us and uh, hope for the best for him from a personal perspective. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for listening. All of that stuff. This has been your goldenblack.com daily quarantine simulcast brought to you by Fox Purdue Bookstores, Purdue Federal Credit Union, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank, East End Grill, and the Charters Team Remax Ability Plus. All of the sponsors who qualify as restaurants, please keep them in mind uh, for carryout orders. Those would be the East End Grill, Sixth Street Dive, Arnie's, Bruno's, and the Whitaker Inn. So thanks, everybody, for, for watching and listening, and we will uh, talk to you again tomorrow.